Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Jennifer Moore. She's the Associate Professor uh, in the Biology Department at Grand Valley State University. Uh, Jennifer is a great partner, collaborator, I don't know what, friend, we're gonna call you a friend, uh, of the Institute. Uh, ever since I've been at the Institute, Jennifer's been there. She's always been doing research at the Institute. Uh, as well as her students, she's a joy to listen to about turtles as well as Eastern Massasauga rattlesnakes and you name it, I swear you study it, Jen, um, it's great. But she also head starts our Eastern box turtle project. Um, and so uh, Jen and her students, I keep talking about our baby box turtles and the trackers, this is Jen's project. Um, and so she's actually gonna talk about research to inform conservation and management of Eastern box turtles. Thanks for the introduction. <laughs> That's awesome, yeah. It, uh, it has been um, a number of years that we've been working now at Pierce Cedar Creek Institute. So I'm really excited to talk about some of the work that we've been doing recently on the box turtles there. Um, and I'm also gonna share a little bit of the work that we've been doing up in Northern Michigan box turtles as well. Um, <clears throat> So thank you everyone for being here as well. It's, it's awesome that we've had such a great turnout today. I'm, I'm, uh, it's, it's so cool. This is one of the perks of virtual things, right? We can get people from all over the world. So very cool. Okay, uh, before I dive into talking about some of the, uh, the cool stuff that we've been doing, I have to mention the people that really have been responsible for doing the bulk of the work here. Um, and these are my students. So grad students and undergraduate students a number of them that have worked on this project, on these projects over the years. Um, so up north, Pat Larman and Joel Tabelli, two of my previous grad students. And then uh, down south, Brianna, Carly, Megan, and Faith. And then um, <laughs> my daughter, Anna, who uh, she's in there. She, she likes to jump in when there's baby turtles involved. Maybe not so much when we're surveying for rattlesnakes, but um, she likes to help out too. So we've gotten lots of support from various organizations over the years for this work, um, notably Pier Cedar Creek Institute, of course, um, who've just been fantastic. And John Ball Zoo, I have to absolutely give a shout out to because the head starting would not uh, be happening without John Ball Zoo um, and their fabulous staff, and especially Bill Flanagan, who's been really super duper involved with this project, which has been just a really neat collaboration um, between all the organizations. Okay, eastern box turtles are um, also in that group of amided turtles that Bruce just talked about, uh, but they're much more terrestrial than some of the aquatic turtles that are also found in this group. Um, I've got a range map here in box eastern, the eastern um, species I'm talking about, subspecies I'm talking about is in orange. So you can see that their distribution is really broad, broad ranging throughout the Midwest and southeastern U.S. And then in, it's got a really interesting distribution in Michigan, I think. Um, you can see that that uh, they really only occur in the northern part of Michigan, the, the lower peninsula on the, the west side of the state. Um, so keep this distribution in mind. Uh, I think it's, I'll, I'll revisit this as we, um, as we get through the talk here. Uh, box turtles, to me, are one of the most beautiful species we have in the state. <laughs> <laughs> They're characterized by um, this really domed uh, shell that tends to be uh, black and, and yellow, but sometimes they're even orange or um, just really variable in pattern. Um, the pattern is unique to the individual, so this doesn't uh, change once it's fully developed throughout the life of the turtle, um, which is really, really cool. You can identify turtles based on their, uh, box turtles based on their, their shell patterns, which is neat. Anyway, just take a second to ooh and ah over the <laughs> beautiful box turtle shells. Um, just, so just briefly, a few things that's, that's relevant to talk about for box turtles. So box turtles are, are a little bit more common than some of the other turtles that we've been talking about today. Um, definitely throughout the rest of their range, but even in Michigan, uh, they tend to be associated with hardwood forests um, and tend to not stray too far from a water source. So. Um, you find them often in riparian habitats or areas where there's wetlands close by. Uh, but again, they are, they're a terrestrial turtle. So they spend uh, the bulk of their time on land. They will go into water, but they don't spend their whole life there. Um, <clears throat> like a lot of our other tur turtle species, they have very uh, 
They're very long lived, so they can live maybe 80, 100 years. Um, and um, like Jim Harding mentioned earlier, these populations require, absolutely, absolutely require um, very high adult survivorship, right? So that's super important that, that these uh, adults are, are living. Once they reach adulthood, uh, we have a very high survivorship. And that of course is what we're, we're seeing as part of the problem with declining turtle populations is that survivorship on these, on these adults is declining for various reasons. Um, and so box turtles have declined in Michigan uh, through, throughout the years. So you can see the MNFI map there on the right um, where they're located. And so they're currently listed as a species of special concern. So definitely one of our rarer turtles, um, but not quite as rare as say something like a spotted turtle in Michigan. And then I'm just gonna point out really quickly, these are absolutely a terrestrial adapted turtle. So if you flip one over, you'll see that it has a hinge on its um, <clears throat> plastron. And that allows it to just close right up in that shell. So it closes its little box right around it. And this is a this is an adaptation, an anti-predator adaptation. So that's a, a great way for them to be protected when they're on land. Um, you can go ahead and try and get in there. And it's, trust me, it's really hard. <laughs> Uh, so I mentioned that too, because this is going to come back. I'll, I'll uh, revisit this when we talk about the head starts towards the end. Okay, just briefly, um, what are these turtles facing in terms of threats? Uh, pretty much like everything else uh, that's rare, um, habitat loss and degradation is a problem. So box turtles have lost a lot of their forested habitat, but also like a lot of our other turtle species, especially in northern climates, uh, they require open canopy habitat uh, for nesting. And so around here, that tends to be things like sand prairies or uh, oak savannas, pine barrens, um, kind of these natural openings that uh, are kind of are threatened now, right? So oak, oak savannas, for instance, are, are, um, are, have declined considerably. And so uh, we tend to have to maintain them, the open status of them using things like prescribed fire. And so that's going to... Um, be important for, for these turtles. There's some conflict there in terms of when you can burn these things and kind of some of the maintenance habitat work that you can do. Um, but yeah, these open canopy nesting sites are, are threatened by natural succession, but also invasion of uh, by woody um, species. So what else? We've heard a lot about road mortality. That's a problem for turtles across the board. Collection for the pet trade. We're not sure exactly um, how many box turtles are, are collected, but we know they are collected illegally. Um, it's, it's very tempting to take these turtles home. They're, um, th they're pretty darn cute. Uh, climate change, which Fred Jansen's going to talk about in a minute. So box turtles do have temperature dependent sex determination where you get uh, um, females at warmer temperatures during incubation, during, during embryonic development in the ground, and then uh, males at cooler temperatures. Um, and then one of the, the biggest ones that, that I'm concerned about and that uh, Jim Harding got at this morning is this problem with um, increased predation on the nests. Um, so we've seen an absolute explosion of what we call mesopredators. So these are things like raccoons and, um, uh, and possums over the years, over recent years. And that's largely because we've gotten rid of those top predators. Um, so we talked about wolves this morning, which I thought was so cool, that link between uh, wolves and raccoons and nest predation. But anyway, we've, got, we've gotten rid of those top predators. And then these mesopredators are really good at dealing with, um, with uh, human habitation. And so we've seen an explosion of them. So at some of these sites, um, you know, th the nests are probably 100% of the nests get predated in areas where you have really high raccoon densities. Um, so we, we really have a problem with nest survival and then ultimately with, uh, with recruitment of individuals into the breeding uh, population. So we don't really have a good handle across the board on how how much nest predation happens but um i have seen some studies that have shown that it can be can be pushing upwards of 100 percent so what this leads to then is that these sort of ghost populations they've been called um where you can go out and you can find adult turtles but they live so long right that they're just um sort of these adults that are hanging on but there's really no reproduction that's happening in the population so over time the population growth rate's declining um, so I worry about that with a lot of our turtles in Michigan and, and box turtles are no exception. <clears throat> so box turtles are actually a really well-studied species. Um, they, they are very broad ranging. So they have a, a, a broad geographic range and they've been studied in lots of different locations. 
Um, but there's a couple of things that we just don't know that much about. And I think it's just because it's really difficult to study. So the first is um, nesting ecology. We don't know that much about um, just sort of natural levels of, of nest predation and, and, and hatching success and that kind of stuff. Um, and then the second one, and this I think is the case for most turtles, is um, the ecology and survivorship of those young age classes. So like the hatchlings and the juveniles. And I think that's probably just because they're really hard to find. Um, and so all this stuff and nests are also really hard to find if you're not like following the females directly to them. So, so it's a lot easier to study adults. Um, so anyway, we kind of wanted to address some of these knowledge gaps. Um, and then ultimately the, the goal is, can we use this information to kind of um, help to form a strategy to kind of mitigate some of these declines, maybe in adult uh, survival. Um, so can we use, can we boost survival of these younger age classes and boost recruitment to make up for some of these declines we're seeing in these older age classes? So, um, so I'm gonna talk about two study sites. The first of which, and this is the, the, the first study that we did or that we're kind of still doing is up in Manistee National Forest. So that's up in Northwestern Michigan. And if you remember back to that range map, it's there, it's right at the tip of uh, the northern uh, range limit for, box, for eastern box turtles, which is kind of neat. Um, so basically, we initiated a, a study up there. We put uh, radio transmitters on, on a bunch of um, adults, we tracked the females to nests, which is what you're seeing over here. And then um, you can watch them. You can sit right next to them with a red light, and they'll just lay their eggs right in front of you. This is an egg plopping out of the back of a eastern box turtle female. Um, and then we were, we wanted to study the, the, the hatchlings. And then we wanted to see sort of like, if we remove, uh, if we remove the effects of predation, like how, what's the natural hatching success rate. So we put these cages over top to protect them from predators. And then we wait a couple months. And then we just allowed the hatchlings to emerge naturally, like this little adorable one in the bottom left here. Um, and then we wanted to know just like, what the heck are these hatchlings doing? So we, uh, collected some morphometric data. So we weighed and measured them. And then we found these tiny little radio transmitters and we stuck them on the side of the, the hashlings. So uh, that's what you're seeing right here. So things sticking off there with the antenna. And then we just followed them around. So um, what you're seeing here, I'm gonna show you a couple images that look like this. The gray in this is a is is um, forest, closed canopy forest. And this, um, I guess it's all gray, isn't it? The, mi the middle whiter part, it is an is a um, oak savanna opening up in in uh, the forest, right? So this is an area where the nest the nesting is really concentrated, because they have to come out of their closed canopy to nest. So all these little um, white circles with the black dots in the middle are nests that we monitored and protected. This is just one of our study areas, so I'm just using this in a, as an example. Um, and then um, so this is tracking movements of individual hatchlings from hatching to overwintering. So the little black dots are where they ended up overwintering. And so uh, timeline wise, that's a period of maybe two months. So earliest they hatch out is late August, latest is October, and then they're overwintering probably in November, right? So that means they go, they find their location and then they burrow down into the soil as much as they can. And for a hatchling, that's really not much. It might be just like right in the duff layer kind of. Um, but the takeaway message here is that they only move on average about 20 meters away from their nest to overwinter, but very directional movements, right? They're moving straight towards those forest edges um, and hopefully making it there, but they sometimes don't, right? So this whole nest uh, overwintered right in the opening, okay? What happens once then they wake up in the spring, um, things start to change a little bit. So they don't move very much in that first year and by June 1st of the following year, they're still within about 50 meters of the nest. So this is that same um, opening. But then after that, once things start to warm up, I think they start to eat a little bit more and then they sort of really start to take off. So you can see the, the figure legend down here in the, or the scale on the bottom left, that's 150 meters. So this one even made it to a wetland over here by August. So that's kind of nifty, um, but very directional movements, um, but they stay sometimes within or in very close proximity to those nesting openings uh, for a considerable period of time. What about survivorship? Okay, so what we could do using this telemetry data was use something called a known fates model, which basically it's a model that um, gives you the probability that these 
animals are surviving over a given period of time. And so it tracks it over time, basically. So this is a hundred percent survival starting over here on the left. And this zero time is uh, when they hatched. And then our goal was like, we wanted to be able to estimate the survival probability over that first year of life, but we didn't, we couldn't keep track of even one individual for a whole year. So we had like 65, 62, 65, neonates that we tracked, my poor grad students, um, did all this work and we either lost them or they all died by the end of that study. So you can see that survivorship really declines. This flat period in the middle is overwintering. Um, and then it really just drops off to our estimate gets, um, really patchy here at about 300 days. That's, we just had very few individuals still left on the air. Um, but it's probably in that first year of life, survivorship may be somewhere between zero in any given year and like maybe 15 or 20 percent of the hatchlings that actually survive that first year. So it's pretty darn low. Um, same type of figure, but it, but now we've separated them out by when the hatchlings uh, emerged from the nest. So sometimes they emerge earlier in September, sometimes they emerge later in October. And we had about half and half. If you come out earlier, you're more likely to survive longer. Um, and that's probably because they've got a little more time to maybe feed. They might not actually be feeding before over, overwintering um, and just find a more suitable location for overwintering. Um, so coming out early gives you a little leg up. And then also being larger when you're born gives you a leg up also. So we, we um, split these up based on the size at hatching. So there's actually a, a, a lot of variability in terms of um, size at hatching. Uh, so some of these guys are like 10 grams and some of them are like five and a half. So little tiny dudes. Um, so the, the bigger ones uh, have, as you can see, this green line here, much higher survival probability. Um, and then just, you, you know, obviously we lost everybody towards the end of the study, but so it kind of all drops down to zero, but um, but much higher survivor probability if you're larger. So that like is in keeping with a lot of the things that we know, right? Just, they're just better able to survive. They're better able to get around and um, maybe predation isn't quite so bad. So you're probably wondering what's killing all these baby turtles? What happened to all of them? We had transmitters on all of them. Well, we were able to actually determine how they died for over 50% of them. Um, so two of them got squished uh, by cars. And remember, this is in a national forest where the only roads that they were dealing with were uh, like unpaved dirt forest roads. Um, so one was squished in a little parking area and another one was squished on a dirt forest road. Um, about 23% got eaten and we could confirm that because there were crunched up transmitters or little bits of shell attached or something. Um, I put, I deliberately put this really evil looking raccoon so that you would all hate raccoons because they eat all the turtles, um, but it wasn't just raccoons. We did have some um, avian predators as well because some of the transmitters ended up in trees. Uh, so it's not just all raccoons, but I suspect that raccoons were uh, responsible for some of them. And then surprisingly, or maybe not surprisingly, about 31% of them uh, just died of exposure to the environment. So we had um, we had a an entire cohort uh, die during overwintering one year. So we had an early an early freeze in like November, and uh, no snow on the ground. So snow is a nice insulating layer, right? It provides nice insulation for them. It's actually warmer when there's snow. And we came back in the spring, and all of those hatchlings were dead. So that's really interesting. Um, and we also had some that just died in the in the nest, never made it out of their nesting areas because they came out of the nests and then they just overheated in the nesting area. So exposure was a big thing. Um, so what are the implications of this wild study? Natural survival of this of hatchlings, even if they make it out of the nest, right? So that's the first hurdle. Then the second hurdle is, um, can they survive that first year? So natural survival is really low. Um, we were surprised that exposure was such a big deal. But again, if you look at the range map where we're located way up here, it, they're probably limited in terms of their expansion based on uh, what the climate's doing up there. Um, so that's probably makes sense for them. Um, predation was high and then bigger was better. So one of the things management wise that we learned was that 
um, you really have to be careful about the timing of prescribed burns. So there's either going to be females in those areas nesting, like in the middle of a, a, a late spring, sort of early summer, or late in the fall, there's going to be hatchlings in there. And even into the early summer, the, some of those hatchlings are still going to be in those uh, nesting openings. So, you know, you could think that all the adults are out of there and you do a prescribed burn, but you're going to torch all your hatchlings. Jen, just to let you know, you've got a five minute warning. Oh, I got to talk faster. Okay. So, um, so that kind of leads us to what can we do, um, to, uh, boost these populations. So head starting is a technique now that I think Jim went over and, and, uh, everybody's kind of familiar with. So we started this at the Institute, um, in the last couple of years, um, the turtles, uh, were, we've been, We've been keeping track of the turtles at Pierce Cedar Creek. We think it's a relatively small population, maybe less than 50 adults, um, relatively low densities and relatively limited recruitment. We know there's nest predation that happens down here, uh, but there's some recruitment. So I'm gonna fly through this last bit. Um, so when the hatchlings come out in October, they look a little something like this. We sent them off to John Ball Zoo and they, they fed them protein powder or something and turned them into these giants over on the right. Um, from October to the following May, uh, they grew about, um, they put on about 20 grams in weight over that time period, which is amazing. And they came out looking like about a two, bigger than about a two to three year old turtle. So this is a head start on the right with its transmitter. This is a wild turtle, a wild box turtle that we found at the Institute over the summer. Um, and you can see the hatchling, the head starts are much bigger. Um, we released the first cohort of head starts in May of 2020. Um, here's, here they are in a box, box turtles in a box. Uh, we put radio transmitters on them and then uh, kept track of them. And what did we found, find? Basically, we think they all survived up until overwintering. Um, so we kept track of seven out of nine of them. Two of the transmitters fell, fell off, but we didn't have any evidence that they were predated. Um, we didn't have any road mortality, but there aren't really any roads nearby them yet. They ate like little pigs. They like slugs. This is a slug hanging off of this one's lip. Um, they, their hinges were totally completely developed. So the, the zoo did a fantastic job of turning these guys into little, little uh, baby adults basically. Um, so predator avoidance is probably happening. And then they selected the appropriate habitats, which is awesome. Um, they had some pretty variable movement patterns but uh, some of them sort of stuck to the, close to the nesting area where they were re released. Others kind of went a little bit broader. Um, and uh, so we want to know, are they growing? Are they acting like normal turtles? And for the most part, they are. From the time that they were released in May to when we checked on them um, in November, after uh, right before overwintering, they gained another, on average, 20 grams in weight and almost three millimeters in length. So even during that time after we released them, they're eating, they're doing all the things that they should. And now they're all tucked in uh, for overwintering. So, whoops, I'm sorry. Let me go back one slide. Whoop, whoop. Uh, so it's very clear here. You'll see that there are two turtles uh, overwintering in down in the soil. These are two of our head starts. Um, they're kind of buried. You can just see the edges of their shells. So we've we're going to keep doing this work. We want to know whether or not this technique is going to be something that is is successful across the board. Can't do we have like really high survivorship of these head starts? which would be super important for recruitment and uh, to boost population numbers at Pierce. So we have 20, 20 more head starts that are currently um, at John Ball Zoo. And the goal is to keep track of those as well as the last cohort um, and then compare them to wild hatch, hatchlings at Pierce Cedar Creek because there's probably differences in terms of wild survival from down south to up north. Um, and then turtles outlive their researchers, which is problematic. So we, <laughs> I'm trying to recruit my daughter who's 11 to, to start this work now so she can like, uh, get into the next generation of turtles. Anyway, I'm going to stop there and just leave you with um, these beautiful rare species that we have in Michigan and say that sometimes we have to do things that seem a little uh, drastic, but, um, but uh, we need to do that sometimes to keep these turtles around. Sorry, Ellen, I think I went too no, long. No, you, you are good. I, I'm trying to leave uh, questions. Time I know, questions. no, that's and good. So that's I, why. No, yeah. you were good. You're good. Um, okay. So we actually have some questions related to these turtles predators. We have a couple of questions in terms of um, with the lack of large predators, would trapping the raccoons be a benefit or do dogs or coyotes actually deter raccoons? Like what else can we do to help 
protect these box turtles uh, in terms of their predators? Yeah, we've talked, a, we talk a lot about that. Uh, what can we, what can we do? Um, the challenge with raccoons is you can trap and trap and trap, and uh, there's always more waiting to move in. Um, and there's actually been some evidence that that sort of uh, a little bit of trapping um, makes things worse. So, <laughs> so I don't know what the solution is because because all of this is really labor intensive. Um, but the the best thing that that I think that we can do right now is just protect those nests or or just dig them up and and bring them in and incubate them. Um, I don't know that the trapping is going to be able to occur on the level that would actually um, benefit them. Maybe we need to bring wolves uh, back down to the lower peninsula. There we go. There we go. <laughs> That's our new management. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so we have another question is how deep do your nest cages go to deter the raccoons digging them? Yeah, we, we bury them. So we bury them about, um, I don't know, like six or eight inches into the ground. Um, and we have had evidence of that, of things trying to get in under them, but knock on wood, we've never had one dug up and eaten that we know of. Yeah, I, I do remember one year when we had an extension that wasn't all the way into the ground. And I think that extension they got into, yep. but the box they didn't, right? <laughs> yeah, because we because we had the one nest that nested right next to one of the cages. So we had yes. to make a, it was like a duplex, but the duplex part didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> yes, very true. I like that. that. That's a good analogy. Um, George is asking, um, how deep do hatchlings or juvenile box turtles dig to overwinter? Um, I think you already mentioned that they do freeze or they can freeze. Um, yeah. uh, and is there anything that is known about best leaf litter or soil conditions for box turtle overwintering? Um, good questions. So are hatchlings hardly dig into the soil at all? they're just, they just don't have the capacity to do that really. So they might get like an inch down sort of. Um, the head starts are a couple of inches maybe down, but the adults will dig down like maybe, I don't know, a foot or more. They, they can really get down there. Um, the other thing that you said, I think uh, Ellen was freezing and these turtles do have some tolerance for freezing. Um, we're not 100% sure on the hatchlings and whether they're as tolerant as, um, as the adults, but there is some, some evidence that they're freeze tolerant. Um, and then the last part of that question was soil conditions that are good for overwintering. I don't know. It doesn't seem like they're, well, it doesn't seem to me anyway, but I'm sure they're very particular about what they're picking. Um, it's not obvious to me like what they're selecting for when they're finding an overwintering site. It's usually um, relatively dry and in the forest, and sometimes it's on a slope. But other than that, that's, that's all I know. It's like what Bruce said. It may look like a nice condition for a turtle, but we don't yep. know what they're looking for. So That's right. Yep. Uh, Don asks, any concern for low bone density in shelf with the rapid growth of the captive rear turtles? Um, so yes. the whole idea that they're, they're really, really big after 10 months, whereas the one in the field was really small after two to three years. Yes, that is absolutely a concern. Um, and anytime you're raising reptiles in captivity, um, you know, bone density and calcium, those are all things that we um, get super concerned about. And the zoo, um, so Ryan Colburn is the vet at the at John Ball Zoo, and he was keeping an eye, a really close eye on them. So so um, we don't want them to grow so fast that they have problems like that, right? So we probably could have fed them even more than we did or the zoo, um, the zoo could have fed them more than we did. And we probably could have even made them bulkier than they were, um, but they actually came out looking really good. We x-rayed all of them um, and their bone densities looked really good. And, and, and I was actually really, really happy with how they, how they came out. <laughs> Awesome. Thanks, Jed. Mm -hmm.